y'all, and welcome back to Country Fried Meanies. I'm your host, Cameron, the country boy in the big city, presenting to you once more from the Bullshit Corner 2.0, and today I'd like to talk to you about this big-ass hunchback. Day. We're going to launch this painting project by hitting this chunker with a solid coat of some mid-gray Steinal Res primer. I've gone with the gray since the colors on this model will be both light and dark. That and I ran out of black primer while painting this project on the Hobby Hangout livestream. Still, even though the decision was made for me, gray is the perfect starting point for this model as there's a variety of tones that'll grace this chassis surface. After many light coats and many, many refills of my airbrush since this Badger Aero Patriot has a tiny cup, we've got to a great point to get rolling. On a side note, and honestly, the tiny reservoir is probably the only negative mark I can ding this here tool. I snagged a pair of these airbrushes from USA Airbrush Supply at a fantastic price, and I don't regret it one bit. Not a sponsor, but a big recommend from me. Anyhow, with the primer on the model, we'll go on to the next non-sponsored product placement. And that's gonna be this here Vallejo Model Color Panzer Aces Camouflage Paint Set. This pack is incredible, giving you 16 colors and various camo-related tones, as well as a pretty solid paintbrush for only around 30 bucks USD. That's got you a fat stack of paints for your collection for less than half the price of a GW pot per bottle. And they're dropper top, so you'll never sweat spilling any of these fabulous colors. Digressing, I don't mean to pump up this kit or talk too long on it, but I do thoroughly recommend padding out your paint supply with this here box. Furthermore, we're gonna paint up most of the hunchback today in these colors to really give it a spin and judge the results after extensive use. Back on topic, now that we've applied the first round of German camouflage black brown for the deepest color, we're gonna move on to some beige brown for the lighter tannish color that makes up this here color scheme. This here hunchback is gonna be the ride of the pilot who'd wear the ridiculous neuro helmet that I made for the Battle of Tukiad video, the Canopus Traveler. So, to give this here gunchback the proper Canopian regalia, I've naturally chosen the first Canopian brigade as the scheme. It consists of a bright green, a dark brown, a tan brown, and a muted blue-green tone, the latter of which will be achieved with this Vallejo German Camouflage Extra Dark Green. In my humble opinion, though perhaps the purchase was informed by this, it's kind of fitting that this color pack contains everything needed to paint up this brigade. So again, if you want to paint up your own brawlers under the command of Felicia Joppa, I can't recommend enough this here paint set to get the work done right not a sponsor. With the initial base coat applied, we're gonna start highlighting by adding in some progressively lighter tones. Our black brown is gonna get a couple of drops of this here German camo medium brown to brighten it up, and then we'll excessively thin down the paint to apply it with a sponge. This layer looks super bright at the moment of application, but given a bit of time, it'll cure down into a really subtle highlight layer that's a touch uneven, contributing to a realistic modeling in the paint's finish. Though this isn't really easy to achieve on mechs in 1 285th scale, this 1 48th Brute will greatly benefit from some semi-random variation in the color. I picked up this technique from watching the Warlord Titan armor paint up over on Midwinter Minis, and I must admit, it's a fantastic method. Once dry, we'll stab at the model with round two, adding even more of the medium brown into the mix. A few layers of this technique will build up a whole lot of texture and color variety while also concentrating the lightest highlights on the sharpest edges. Sponge work is such a fun approach to painting up your big models, and I just can't get over how it's both random and precise at the same time. It's even a great time saver, throwing out many notions of careful precision to your application, instead letting the uneven surface of the sponge do the heavy lifting. 
The tool interacts with the raised edges of the model in a convenient fashion that mimics some of the effects we'll achieve with traditional brushwork, similar to a good dry brushing, but with a more broken up application pattern. It just about does the thinking and the painting for you. I definitely recommend giving this technique a go the next time you need some chunky big boy of a project painted in a hurry. Next up, we're gonna add in some intermediate green to our German camouflage dark green. Though this color looks substantially brighter than the previous layer, it'll do to remember that we're thinning these colors down quite a bit more than you'd normally go for. The super thin paint goes on in a fairly translucent treatment, allowing the colors from before to show through the uneven coverage. Similarly, we'll add in some tan earth to that beige brown to get another hit of that super bright contrasty highlight action. We're taking a bit of care at this point to not hit the areas of differing colors, but still going at this with a jabby and aggressive approach, always letting the sponge do the work for us. At this scale, it pays to work smarter and not harder. A side note here, but I want to mention how beautifully the details on this HBK 4G torso pick up color. Make sure to check out Locust Labs over on Patreon if you want to snag one yourself and give it a try. Back on topic, our sponged on highlight layers are going to go so far as to incorporate a touch of Liquitex white ink getting a real vivid final highlight step to the uppermost edges of the tan portions of this big ass model. This penultimate layer of punchy highlight is gonna go a real long way in mimicking the play of light on the armor panels. Further, it's just enough tonal variation to really help sell a bit of damage in the paint's finish, replicating a myriad of superficial scratches and a touch of sun bleaching. Now that we've made it through almost all of the sponge work for the model, we're gonna move on to another important color in the form of this here Vallejo Metal Airbrush Color Jet Exhaust. Unfortunately, we're stepping out of the box for this color as the Panzer Aces set did not come with a good choice for mica-infused metallics. In any case, I've spoken at length in most of my content about this amazing product. This here paint applies beautifully and with heavy saturation regardless of the method of use. Whether you're using an airbrush or applying it by hand, these metal colors give solid one coat coverage without a need for any thinning. Another tangent here, but at some point during the live streamed hobby sessions, I decided to add a few panels in yellow to represent field repair panels from ill matching secondhand parts. For that, I went with my golden brand Hansa yellow paint, which was actually a poor choice with too much vibrancy and abysmal coverage. If you decide to go for some kind of yellow paneling, I'd recommend a product by Citadel or Vallejo for better and easier results. Now back on track with the Panzer Aces selections, we're gonna start putting on some uniform green for the lightest tone on our four colors that make up the first Canopian Brigade regalia. This color gets used a bit more sparingly than the others, its application understated on just a few panels, as well as an offset stripe running down the torso. We'll put this paint on just like the original base coats, taking care to get solid opaque coverage with a careful application of two thin coats, instead of globbing it on thick. This precision is especially important in establishing the stripe, since we want some neat straight edges. If this model was being painted with an airbrush, we could achieve solid results with masking. And though I suppose a mask could have helped here too, this chungus is large enough to get neat enough results with a bit of manual dexterity. Now applied where we need it, it's time to highlight this color with a touch of Vallejo ivory paint. Once again, we'll hit the model with this brighter tone applied super thinly using the sponge. Switching over to a new sharp three round liner from Princeton Art and Brush Co. We'll also take a moment to add in some traditional edge highlighting on the hard edges of the stripe. A nice sharp brush will ensure that we have great accuracy in application and that the lines aren't too thick. Continuing that good old fashioned brush work, we'll double down with some more ivory and slap that last layer on the tips of the sharpest edges of our highlights, just like y'all slap that like button. All joking aside, the almighty algorithm loves when you tickle that button, just like we're tickling the tips of these edge highlights. 
that we've got this big chungus all face coated up, sponged up and down, and edge highlighted, it's time to get on to getting on to putting some color onto these fabulous little cat girl infantry. Alrighty then, let's take a moment to give these little base accoutrements a touch of love. After all, it's cat girls that really cement the trope of a canopian outfit. These here cat girl infantry have been sculpted by Zidark Penguin over on Cults 3D. They are, in fact, proxies for Warhammer 40,000 Astra Filatera. If you'd like to build up your own Imperial Guard force with these fantastic feline gals, just search up this artist's wonderful Valtarian Winter Guard and tell them that Country Fried Mini sent you. We're going to be painting these gals with some translucent colors, and to get the most out of this time-saving technique, we'll start with a nice hard white on black zenithal prime gel. As always, we'll be doing this with Steinal Res primers, which are conveniently sold in a triad of colors, white, mid-gray, and black. From here, we'll take advantage of that freshly cured zenithal prime job and prepare our wet palette for some wet ass paint. This time around, I'm gonna be using both my Army Painter Speed Paint as well as Citadel Contrast Colors, both of which are indeed liquidy liquids more wet than your usual acrylic paints. For that, I've elected to utilize the lighter hardened leather speed paint for the hard plates of flak armor on these gals, reserving the darker snakebite leather contrast color for their fatigues. The tonal variation between these two tones is fairly subtle, but present nonetheless. It'll make the brown overtone of the uniforms fairly cohesive while helping the different portions of their clothes read as different materials. Next up, we want to continue with that theme of tonal variation, this time electing to go with several skin tones for the gals. I'll be using three colors from my WizKids Learn to Paint Flesh Tone set, Cadmium Skin, Heavy Skin Tone, and Parasite Brown. There's a total of eight armed ladies on the base, and I'd hate to have them all looking exactly the same color. Folks come with variety in real life, so these folks will have some variety on this base. That said, we're still gonna unify the color palette with the next step wherein they're gonna get a hefty soaking with flesh wash, serving to create the shadows and add a bit of unifying shade tone. With a thorough saturation of this blush color, these gals will instantly have some life brought into the palette and flat base tones that I've chosen for their skin. In effect, the base coats serve as the mid-tone rather than the shadow color, which is instead established via a few drops of liquid talent. In this case, darkening the recesses as well as adding the illusion of blood running beneath the skin. And with these gals looking mighty flushed, they evoke sweaty action on the battlefield while also selling the idea of a cohesive force unified via similarities in both skin tones and uniform color. I always find it super remarkable how much change can be achieved with a simple wash over your base coat. In this case, it's not only creating the illusion of vivacity, but also pulling the overall tone of these models into that of a unified paint scheme. Continuing with the theme of unified color range, we'll go on to create the highlights on these models using the same shade to bring out the lighter areas. In this case, that same color is gonna be a drop or two of pale flesh added to the original shade. Using a brand new sharp synthetic 3.0 liner brush, we'll carefully apply this new mix boldly but sparingly, creating the illusion of light falling upon the upper surfaces of their skin while simultaneously pushing their overall tonality into similitude. Going back to that uniform green from the Panzer Aces set, we're going to hit a few of the armor plates on the gals to tie them into the color choices of the hunchback itself, once again adding a bit of cohesivity to the overall palette of the piece as a whole. From here, I don't want to spend too long on the details of painting up what amounts to base accents, so enjoy this hodgepodge of a montage that is the application of various tones in various places using various methods. Among all the variety of steps, we've added a camo pattern to the field gun, some bright red and blue wires to the las guns, some super vibrant candy tinted hair colors, various cat fur options for their tails and ears, metallics on their weaponry, some simple lens jeweling on the optics, and even some ink washing to unify the colors while also adding extra detail by dropping shadows in the recesses. In short, and accented by that mouthful of descriptors, 
there were a ton of little touches that made these feline warrior women into what they are, and to spend a bunch of time on that would honestly do a disservice to the project's brevity. There's a lot that ended up going into these gals, but they aren't the star of the show. That title is of course reserved for the utterly fabulous hunchback sculpt provided by the sponsor of today's video, Locust Labs. Howdy y'all, Cameron here breaking the fourth wall picture in picture to come out here and tell you all about the amazing STL files made available by Locust Labs over on Patreon. It's 3 a.m. in the morning and I should be working on this here editing, but I'm busy scrolling through the posts here and languishing over which model to print out next. You too can get in on these fabulous and well-designed models for less than $10 monthly, giving you access to a regular hot drop of a fat variety of home printable designs curated for your Battletech tabletop experience. Join up today and get access to the grab bag featuring the full metal Yosa Tank and Meteor Fighter. This release has a multitude of parts allowing for super deep customization of your brand new models. Another hearty special thanks to Locust Labs for proposing this project. Make sure you support their support by checking them out. That's patreon.com forward slash Locust Labs. With all the basic work done on these Astrophilitarum Catgirl Infantry, it's time to get back to this model and put some hefty work into that there freehand material on the front be a lot of fun. So why don't you dig in and see what we've got in store. To get this freehand effort started up, we'll first get out a nice and fairly sharp number two pencil. I'm quite partial to Ticonderoga pencils myself. They have consistently provided quality performance in note taking, art creation, and hobbying alike. Keeping our reference at hand during the whole process, we'll start by sketching a rough guideline of the shapes we wish to create. From here, we're going to apply our darkest tones first, starting with this German camouflage extra dark green. This paint will be thinned as per the norm, alongside some extra drops of clean water on the palette to facilitate blending. Following this, we'll start to fill out the greens of the outer ring of the magistracy symbol, selecting uniform green as the next tone. It's absolutely proper to roughly lay this shade on top of a significant portion of the previous color to roughly block out the main tones of the ring. We'll also start to lay a green foundation for the inner circle while we're at it. This layer will go on while the previous color is still pretty wet, blending the tones together into a smooth gradient, culminating with a touch of yellow blended in at the top of the ring. We'll just go back and forth with little touches of these three colors, blending and blending again until it looks pretty decent. With the yellow greens applied, we'll start to work in blue tones, beginning with adding in Vallejo Game Color Jade Green. This bluey greeny color will establish the cooler tones on the center circle's background, all the while taking time to wet blend it in just like the rest of the colors so far. Next up, we want to put some proper blue down for the little star field at the bottom of the symbol. Electing to use Golden Fluid Acrylics Thalo Blue and Citadel's Calidor Sky. All the while minding our sketched on guidelines, we'll put down the darker tone first and add in the lighter one bit by bit, again blending all the while. Definitely don't be afraid of a little back and forth action here. Just feel free to poke and prod at this color patch until it starts to look right. Even if you mess it up, you can always simply paint right over it again. Though I believe in you and know it'll turn out just fine. Next on the agenda are the little purple planets, which we'll establish using a touch of Citadel's Gene Stealer Purple. Once we put it on, we'll mix in a bit of Liquitex white ink to create a rounded highlight towards the upper left of each of these shapes creating a hint of dimensionality. These are perfectly fine to stay a bit on the rougher side as they'll get further details layered on top of them. From here, the next detail is gonna be the gold rings. To lay out the foundation for this part, we'll select some Citadel Contrast Nasdreg Yellow. We'll use a nice sharp 3-0 liner brush and mix this with a touch of our yellow from before. Moving in with a steady hand to trace out some thin lines surrounding the inner circle as well as the little purple planet. With these lines established, we'll turn to our yellow to start brightening up these edging elements. Since we're going for a mild non-metallic metal effect here, the yellow will be boosted up pretty dang bright, making sure to develop some serious contrast between the highlight and shadow tones. To maintain this effect, 
We want to keep small patches of the darkest color butted right up against the brightest. We should see areas of our Hansa yellow directly touching the Nasdrag yellow without any blending in between. Even though this isn't a hard rule to the process, the metal effect will be largely created by a few spots of hard contrast. Moving forward and punching the intensity of the contrast up, we'll get back out the Liquitex white ink, putting some small spots of pure white both blended into the Hansa yellow patches and right next to the Nasdrag yellow shadows. And with just three colors, some careful blending, and some choice contrast, we've made this gold look pretty damn shiny. Now we're on to what is arguably the scariest part of the whole process, wherein we're going to outline the last remaining details, starting with tiny five-pointed stars in the center of the little purple planets. Ensuring we take time to slightly rotate the direction of each star, we'll have a bit of subtle variation between the three pentalphas. While we have the blackout, a nerve-wracking fine black line will also be drawn around the perimeter of the outer ring. A quick tip here is to slowly exhale while pulling your lines, and they'll stay quite on point. Just don't hold your breath, else you'll tense up and wobble all over the place. Finally, we'll do the final touches. Using our non-metallic Simple Blends gold-making technique to shine up our five-pointed stars, and then adding tiny little dots of Liquitex white ink to represent the wider galaxy in the star field below. These last few bits are the crowning jewels on our perfectly passable Magistracy of Canopus symbol. I'm not usually one to toot my own horn, but this freehanding bit came out great. I give myself two paint-stained thumbs up. Before we wrap this portion up, I'm gonna get back out my trusty pencil and start sketching out a unit number marking for this stompy, shootin', rootin', tootin', AC-20 wielding, most filthiest of all the medium, medium mechs. Naturally, the Canopus Traveler, a seasoned merc and enjoyer of personal liberty stationed on Canopus 4 for years, could only have one possible number designation. And yes, it is absolutely that number. What other direction could I have possibly taken other than directly into hedonism? Nice. Because the... With that fine freehanding out of the way, it's time to move on and put the final touches on the model. That's going to involve stuff such as weathering and some chipping using a sponge and a brush, as well as lens jeweling and the cockpits as well. It's going to be a lot of fun, so let's hop on in and see this thing get finished. Okay then. We're stepping into one of the best portions of working on a Battletech model of any scale. Definitely one of my favorites. Our final detailings will begin with some heavy sponge chipping. My go-to color combination these days is a 50-50 mix of German camouflage black-brown and hull red, both from the Vallejo model color line. Unlike the previous sponging steps, we're not going to thin these paints at all. Instead, loading up the sponge and then removing almost all of the paint, up until it leaves tiny speckles when pressed into a surface. Once prepped, we'll take our sponge and jab at the surfaces of the model in a semi-random fashion, focusing a bit heavier on sharp edges and surfaces that seem like they'd experience more rubbing or impacts than others. To add that extra je ne sais quoi to the effect, we can add some spots of metallic paint in the biggest blotches of ruddy black brown and that's looking fantastic. Next up, we're going to get stuck into some lens and cockpit action, jeweling them up to give the illusion of shine. To start with, this here golden fluid acrylics carbon black will darken up the laser lenses with its rich pigmentation, lending a perfectly jet canvas upon which to paint this illusory detail. This here hunchback has three lasers, one torso mounted small and two mediums on the arms. We'll start up on the brachial armaments. I prefer my medium lasers in red, as was the case in Mech Warrior 4, so for that, we'll get out some Mephiston red as well as a bit of Fire Dragon bright. With those paints put out, we'll put a fat swoop of red towards the lower right and a much finer crescent line of the orange as a highlight. Next, it falls back onto the Liquitex white ink to give us just the tiniest dot of pure white up towards the upper left to represent the specular highlight born of sunlight. Similarly, we'll do up the small laser using the same steps, but swapping out the red and orange for Warboss green and Phalanx yellow. Returning once more to the bright white to sell the idea of that blinding shine. 
finally, we'll give a somewhat samey treatment to the cockpit glass itself, starting with a heavy coating of the carbon black. Getting out some Calidor Sky, we'll work this bright blue into the lower right corner utilizing wet blending techniques. If we use properly thin paint in a heavy handed fashion, a fairly smooth blend can be achieved with very little effort. After some concentrated back and forth, a nice gradient will be developed and then we can cap it off with a specular highlight in the form of a dot of pure white. Man, that hefty muzzle flash coming off of the Hunchback's Tomudzuru AC-20 sure is awe-inspiring. Arguably, Kaliyama Weapons Industries HBK-4G is little more than a platform for marching this outrageous cannon right up in your opponent's grill and blasting away with reckless abandon. This oversized, fear-inducing weapon gives the Hunchback its characteristic hunch silhouette and it's well deserving of a bit of extra respect, hence taking some time to add in this upscaled bolter blast muzzle effect. I'd go so far as to argue that just about every mech warrior worth their salt has a tale to tell about the Hunchback, whether stories of their own triumphs against monster machines or nightmare scenarios where their prized assault chassis got cored by this 50 ton bruiser. The Hunchback does everything that the urban mech tells you it can do while failing to deliver, it stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with foes that on paper outclass it, and it cuts them down with brutal efficiency. It may not have the endurance to take on a lance alone, but I'd take my chances against any lone mech of any size with this Big Booma. One well-placed shot from a Kaliyama Big Bore AC-20 will easily send an unprepared mech jock to those stables in the sky. Nothing beats this kind of raw power, full stop. Now that this model's paint job is completely finished, it's time to move on to those final little touches on that base. We're going to build up some terrain and arrange the infantry around and maybe add some trees and some foliage as well. It'll look great at the end, so let's see how it went. Here at the end, we need to start using some glue, and for that, we'll introduce today's guest palette, and it's this waifu cat girl. She'll hold on to all the sticky fluids while we get this massive model assembled. A surplus of super glue in every joint with a liberal squirt of accelerator will serve to hold even these giant pieces together. Although these parts are absolutely huge, they're still made of fairly lightweight PLA while also only made with a 15% infill. Their lightweight ensures that this medium strength and medium viscosity cyanoacrylic glue will work well to hold them together. Then, while our chonkin' machine is drying, we'll take a little time to build a mild diorama for the base. To build up the skeleton of this vignette, I'll be using some ready board cut into some terrace layers to create just a bit of verticality, making sure to take a little time to mark where our battle mech as well as the troops will go. We can use the base itself as a cutting guide to start off the terraces with a nice matching hex shape, and then mark some free-flowing organic shapes in with a pencil before going back at them with a nice sharp hobby blade. After building up a few layers of decreasing size, they'll be stuck together using some more PVA glue and weighted down while they dry. This whole portion of the process took about an entire day as the PVA in such quantities is really slow to dry. It's a good thing to remember when embarking on a project of this scope. Make sure you have something else to work on in the meantime so as to not waste your time. Once we've got all those layers cut down and glued in place, I'm gonna use some craft grade fast mache to make a hearty paste that'll make swift work of giving the ground its initial texture. Colored up with a mix of cheap craft paints and spread out all over this 12 inch hex base, it'll dry rock hard and smooth out the obvious elevation changes. Moving on, and since we're working in such a massive scale, I want to add some trees to the project. 
I think they'll do wonders to help sell the scale of what's really going on. And for that, it's time to get out the power drill and make some holes for the tree trunks. With the tree holes bored out and reamed, I'll add in the sandbags for our field gun, as well as some Gale Force 9 basin grit to create some textural variation on the base. Once it's dry, I'll get back out the airbrush and use various shades of browns and tans and grays to make a unified surface color. The airbrush really makes light work of this part, really making it a joy to apply a variety of colors to build up not only some mild highlights, but also some naturalistic mottling in the ground color. Nature isn't perfect after all, so we want to make our imitation of nature reflect that, even if it's just a dirt patch we're replicating. While it's drying, now's a great time to start blacking out the base rim with my favorite golden fluid acrylic carbon black. On deck again is our cat girl palette, and she's gonna help us once again by holding on to a bit of glue while we apply some flocking and birch seeds. A side note here, I almost left this scene out, but I know this is what y'all really want, ain't it? We'll pick up the sticky white goo off of our cat girl and apply it in a fairly controlled fashion to the big old base, letting us build up some sizable but not overbearing patches of Gale Force 9 summertime turf flocking mixture. With the ground texture applied, next up is putting the trees into their holes with a surplus of white PVA glue, ensuring they have a strong and lasting bond. After the white stuff, we'll switch to the clear and apply the Canopian soldiers to the base using some BSI cyanoacrylic glue plus a touch of accelerator. The speed of the super glue is great to lock the gals in place instantly, and the accelerator is fantastic because it keeps the glue fumes from crazing the paint that surrounds their tootsies. Of course, we're not done with the glue varieties yet, so we'll get out some B7000 and our trusty Gorilla brand hot glue gun and use both of these viscous liquids to adhere our star to its forever home. The combination of these two glues will add a lot of strength to the connection. And as a last touch, a big old blob of hot sticky glue will serve to seat the muzzle flash effect in the barrel of this fat AC-20. So without further ado, all that's left is the grand reveal. I want to thank y'all for joining me today. This project has been a whole lot of fun and I couldn't have done it without that initial product pitch over from Locust Labs. Special thanks to over to them. Go ahead and check out their Patreon if you want to get your hands on some of these fabulous models coming out every month over there. This here model may not be literally the biggest Battletech model on the planet, but it's the only time I've ever seen one done in 148 scale. It's a huge chunker and it's been a huge project too. It's been a lot of fun and a long time coming but I'm sure glad to have it here and out and done. And now it's time to do that final YouTube thing. If you ain't already tossed a like or a sub down below, I'd love it if you went ahead and done that. And I'd love it if you join up as the newest channel member here at Country Fried Me. For as little as a dollar a month, you can join up and get access to fabulous things such as a badge next to your name, biscuit-based emojis, and a permanent discount in the Threadless store. I really couldn't get these projects done and out without the tireless support of the Country Fried Minis community. I wanna thank y'all once again for joining me today. And I want you to remember to be happy while you're painting. Take it easy, fellas. See you around next time.